This program airs statewide on California Public Television and is a California's Gold classic. He billed himself as the last of the jackass prospectors, and his name was seldom seen slim. Then there was Carl Mengel, born of German immigrant parents. He was known as Pegleg Mengel. Then there was Harry Hughes, who maintained he was descended from British royalty. And Walter Sorensen, who was known all over as a jovial, likable fella. And don't forget about Shorty Harris, known for telling tall tales, and Shoshone Johnny, and Indian George, and countless others. All of them, honest to goodness, real California pioneers. California characters who called Death Valley home. And we've come here to Death Valley to find out firsthand about one of those characters. In fact, he's probably the most famous and best known character of them all. Now his legal name was Walter E. Scott, but nobody called him that. Everybody knew him as Death Valley Scotty, and this guy was an original. In fact, he lived in a castle about 40 miles from where we're standing right now. In fact, that's where we're heading. And if you'd like to see his castle and find out more about Death Valley Scotty, as always, you're invited to join us as we all continue our search together, this time in Death Valley, for California's goal. Death Valley is a vast and wonderful place, full of surprises and contrast, rich in history and folklore. And no Death Valley story is richer or more colorful than that of Death Valley Scotty and his friend Albert Johnson, an unlikely pair who built a magnificent castle in an unlikely place. Located in Grapevine Canyon, 3,000 feet up in the very northern portion of Death Valley, Scotty's Castle and the story behind it is legend. Good morning. Well, good morning to you, sir. How are you doing? I'm Huell Hauser. Oh, I'm Bill Osterman. How are you doing? I uh, play Scotty out here in the living history. Well, you look a little bit like Scotty. I've seen pictures of him. We're going to talk a little bit about that in just a minute. But I guess to start things off, standing here in front of this castle, the obvious question is, what is something like this doing in the middle of Death Valley? Well, if you were a millionaire and you lived in Chicago, wouldn't you like to have a place that you could come to that nobody would bother you at? Yeah. Well, that's what happened. Mr. and Mrs. Johnson, who are millionaires in Chicago, came out here, built this place as their winter home, and got to be real good friends with Scotty. He was, uh, he was a financier, uh, or he was a miner that they invested in, and. Scotty introduced them to the desert and they decided that they loved it out here so much for his health and everything else. They decided that this is where they were going to uh, build their winter home. So, so this wasn't Scotty's castle originally. This was built by Mr. and Mrs. Johnson. It was built by Mr. and Mrs. Johnson, but if you asked Scotty who owned it, he would have said, well, Mr. and Mrs. Johnson live here and they don't pay any rent, and Scotty lives here too. He doesn't pay any rent, so you figure out who owns this place. How did these two guys get together? How did they become friends to start with? Well, Mr. Johnson invested in Scotty's uh, gold mine out here and uh, never worked out. In fact, he invested about the $25,000 uh, and then found out there was really no gold mine out here. But on his visit to the desert, he found out that his health was so improved and uh, it was unique out here. And Scotty showed him how to ride horses and how to hunt, get him away from his busy business world out there. They got to be real good friends, friends till their deaths in the 40s and 50s. This tremendous friendship that built up between these three people, Mr. and Mrs. Johnson and Scotty. So really, part of the story of Scotty's castle, and I guess the very beginning part of the story, is the friendship that developed that caused all of this to happen. That's right, and the irony of this whole thing is that there's three people that you never expect to get together. The only thing that these three people really had in common 
is the fact that they were all born in the year 1872, but from there on, their lives are so different, and they got together to be good friendship. Mr. and Mrs. Johnson and Scotty. And Scotty. Okay, let's take a tour around the place because this is a this is a fascinating place stuck right out here in the middle of nowhere. Why did why did Mr. Johnson choose this place? Well, take a look at that view. There's one thing that we can see right from here. Beautiful view from up here in the mountains on the, on the hillside. This was farmland at one time. It was fertile enough. Trees were in. Plenty of water. So there was water. Absolutely. There's a stream over here that runs at the rate of 200 gallons of water a minute. Uh -huh. In fact, that would have filled, filled this swimming pool out here had it been completed. So this was going to be a swimming pool. 270 feet long. Oh, look, this is the other part of it down here. This is the part that would have had the diving boards in it and diving platforms, 12 feet deep at this end, shallower at this end. If you came in with your limousine and this was completed, you would have come up on the other side here, been escorted across the pool and into the house here. Look at this. This is unbelievable. So it wasn't even ever finished. That's right. The thing is, though, Mr. Johnson, see, this is supposed to be a swimming pool, but the state of California would have uh, had big filters, sand filters, too expensive. So Scotty just called it his lake at his castle. <laughs> So it was not designated a swimming pool. That's right. It was a lake. It was really a swimming pool, but if you asked anybody officially, it was a lake. Right here. <laughs> now look at all of this. What was all of this? The bell tower. Beautiful chimes up there that sound off uh, in conjunction with the clock. This is the powerhouse down below. Architecture is a little different than the rest of the building. The powerhouse. Yep. That raises the question of how did they have electricity out here? They did, all the time they were building and everything else. Mr. Johnson was an ex-engineer, so he had to give up that career because of a broken back and went into insurances, which he made all his money. But a lot of the engineering uh, ability uh, still showed up here as uh, he would have water come down from that water source into the powerhouse, hooked to a Pelton water wheel. It produces initial electricity as early as the early 1920s. He always had electricity out here. So they always had their own electricity out here. Yep, they had to supplement that later with diesels, and they're also in there, but they, we, we still use the Pelton today. Really? It still generates our night security lights. How long did it take them to build this place? About eight years. He started in 1922, and uh, because of the Depression and the land dispute, had to suspend building in 1930, not completing the place evident by that swimming pool. Uh, however, when he did build it, he had 50, 50, 40, 50, 60 people working out here on construction at all time. So there's a lot of, a lot of activity going here. You can see some of the other things that were not completed down in here. Oh, so these there's columns one. down here were That would have been housing for the, uh, on the backside, the housing for the employees there. And this would have been a beautiful rose garden that we're looking at for Mrs. Johnson in this courtyard had it been completed. How did they, where did they get the workers? Who were the workers? Who built this place? Well, we had a, uh, a lot of uh, early Americans that had a camp not too far from here, about a mile from here. They, uh, they came in and worked as laborers, mostly on the concrete work. And in fact, the fence posts that surround the property, over 14,000 of those were made by the Indians. They also had uh, skilled workers, tile setters, wood carvers, and, uh, and iron, uh, iron metal workers. The, the uh, wood carvers, a lot of them were imported from Europe, from Austria, and that, to give them the quality of the wood that they've got inside. So they did this place right. Absolutely. You figure this is 50 years old, and uh, sure, it needs some maintenance, but it's still holding up pretty good. Uh, the way he built it. What was the idea, to create an honest-to-goodness castle, or has it just gotten that name over the years? Well, the only, it got that name, actually, it was uh, called the Death, uh, Death Valley Ranch. That's what Mr. Johnson called it, and, uh, but uh, Scotty, whenever anybody was interested in finding out what happened up here, he'd just tell them, oh, I am just building myself a castle with the money from my secret gold mine. <laughs> Johnson used him as a front man in this uh, friendship that they developed, you see. <laughs> Now, people say you look like Scotty, you dress like Scotty. Is this the way, if we had met Scotty, he would have looked? 
this is it. Uh, I came out here six years ago as a volunteer. They noticed this resemblance, and now I'm a park ranger impersonating Scotty. He always had a nice Stetson tipped off the right of his head, and he also wore a red tie. Dark pants, white shirt. That was his, his sign. When he went into town, he was always recognized by that sign. And uh, uh, well, it recognized all over the Northern Cali and Southern California, really, from Los Angeles all the way up to San Francisco. Now, you mentioned, you mentioned Los Angeles. He had a lot of celebrity friends, didn't he? He did. A lot of them came out here to visit. Uh, actually, Mr. Johnson's estate moved from Chicago to Hollywood. So people like Betty Grable and Betty Davis and John Barrymore and Will Rogers came out here. You to know, this castle? Yeah, they stayed here. You know, that must have been an interesting night when Will Rogers and Scotty were telling stories here. I bet you that was a late <laughs> night for guests, huh? A lot of tall tales. <laughs> oh, you bet. Did Mr. Johnson mind that Scotty was getting all the attention and was always in the spotlight and, and he was kind of always in the background? No, not really. Uh, Johnson, uh, when he built this place, uh, uh, built it for his own winter home, but he wanted to keep it away from people. He didn't need the publicity, so Scotty was the front man that took care of this. So all these stories and all this information that was fun funneled through Scotty was, uh, was what he was looking for. This was uh, his recluse, his, his place to come out here in the, in the winter and just enjoy himself. So what happened? People just kind of started finding out about the place and started coming out here on their own just to just well, to find really, out what it was like? It was really uh, after the Depression in the early 1930s that people started coming out here and visiting Death Valley National Monument. And they came over and they wanted to see this place too. And, and that's how this got to be a, 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 a part of the National Monument, really. Uh, and then they would go back home and tell these stories, which I'm sure grew in their telling, and more people would want to come out Absolutely. and meet this guy named Scotty. Absolutely. And by 1937, they were giving tours out here and renting out some of the rooms by 1939. That's when it uh, kind of became a bed and breakfast place. Yes, it did, in 1939. Scotty knew a lot about Death Valley, didn't he? He sure did. He was out here since from 1903 and met Johnson in 1904 and found out all kinds of things about the mines out here. Uh, uh, convinced people that he owned a mine out here. He used to sell stock in his mine uh, uh, out here that didn't exist. But uh, would they go out over these hills? Did sure he would, know yeah. this area? He would go out. They'd go out for days at a time. In fact, Mr. Johnson's health was so poor, but improved so at this in the desert, uh, because Scotty showed him how to ride and how to have a good time out here, get him away from his business world. So they'd go out for days at a time and. Uh, have a grand old time out there, as stories relate. Uh, so actually, Scotty helped Mr. Johnson's health by turning him on to Death Valley and all of the kind of therapeutic, I guess it was as much That's physical right. or, or just psychological? Well, or? it was physical. You, you know, a lot of people ask why uh, Mr. Johnson spent all this time and money on, on, uh, on uh, Scotty and uh, Mr. Johnson replied many times, well, Scotty's repaid me many times in laughs. And you think about it, if you were a millionaire, and would you spend about $100,000 on a good therapist? And yes, you'd have to say yes. And uh, probably Scotty got about that much out of this deal. Well, we know Mr. Johnson felt better, probably had his life extended. So, you know, that's, uh, that's part of the, uh, the deal out here when he and, John, uh, Scotty, he and Scotty got to be good, such good friends. Now we have come inside the castle, and it's kind of dark in here. Well, yeah, it's uh, dark right now because of uh, preservation and preserving all the furnishings and everything, realizing that most of the things here are 50 years old, and we have a, you know, a great curatorial staff taking care of this. But it was a lot lighter at one time when the Johnsons lived here and when Scotty lived here. Now, this, you brought me here because this was... Scotty's and I guess the Johnson's favorite room. This is where it, it was. really happened yeah. in here. Well, this is where uh, they did most of their entertaining, you know, and it wasn't card playing or anything like that. It was basically storytelling and uh, conversation. And by now you must have guessed who was our storyteller, huh? Old Scotty would sit there and Mr. Johnson here and guests would share these couches with Mrs. Johnson and, and they'd be telling stories. He'd be listening to his stories till the wee hours of the morning because, well, the more you laughed at his stories, the more he keep you entertained. This is a beautiful room. 
you can almost feel what it would have been like. Would they have had a fire going here? They might have had a fire going here, sure. This is just wonderful. Waterfall over here. This was a waterfall. Not working. That provided the humidity out here for needed for preservation and also for cooling. Yeah, that must have been rather nice listening to that water flowing over those jasper rocks, huh? So they had the water coming down here. Yep. This is great. Right. Fountain down below. Plants all around here. And you got a tour going by right up here on the... Yeah. Is everybody having a good time? Yeah. You're enjoying Scotty's Castle? Yeah. <laughs> now I hear music playing. Yeah, that's the organ. The $40,000 organ that was installed in the 1920s. So this was the music room. Yeah. What would they do in here? Just sit and listen to this music? Sit and listen to music. Neither the Johnsons nor Scotty know how to play any musical instruments, so they, everything was self-playing. We're now using a self-player to, uh, to play the, the organ and the piano at the same time. So they would bring their guest up here and would sit around like this and, and on a hot summer's Death Valley night and listen to this wonderful organ music. And if you were a guest and you knew how to play the piano, you probably got an extra invitation a year just to come out here and play for them. They love to have people play for them. Now the castle is magnificent, but a few miles down the road, way off the beaten track, is the place Scotty really preferred. A small, unassuming cabin where he felt at home and actually spent a lot of time. It was there I met up with Mary Lidicote, the lady who not only was responsible for running the castle from 1948 to 1970, but was also president of the board of directors of Mr. Johnson's foundation the Gospel Foundation of California. Her years of friendship and close association with the Johnsons and with Scotty give her a unique insight and also some wonderful stories to tell. Well, this was considered the lower ranch. Scotty lived here much longer than he lived at the castle. So he didn't like the castle that much no, to live in. No, no, he preferred this because he could have his mules and uh, dogs and wild horses and cats <laughs> now, <I'd> and rats. <laughs> I had heard that he liked mules. Yes, he did. And he was, was, had many of them down here. And two of them, one was Betty the bell mule and Goldie was with Betty all the time. One time when I was here to visit Scotty, he said, I'm going to make some pancakes. Sit down, Murray, and we'll, we'll have some pancakes. So he made pancakes, and I heard the door slam. And I thought, I don't know who that could be. So I looked up, and here were two mules coming in the house. They had smelled the pancakes. <laughs> and so he put more pancakes on, and he put them on the table, and the four of us ate pancakes. You and Scotty and the two and mules. The two mules, yes. <laughs> and he had a dog. I've seen a picture of him standing right here with a dog. Yes, Queenie. And she was bit by a rattlesnake snake when I was here. And she's buried right over here. Wow. But he enjoyed this place because he would be by himself, could do what he wanted to do when he wanted to do it. Looking at this view out here, now this is the view that Scotty would have had sitting out here on his front porch. It was magnificent. Yes. He said there's nothing like it. He took the bathtub out of the house and placed it over here by the tree. Right out here? Yes. And he had water running in it all the time. And he was in it a good part of the time. So this is the tub he would be sitting in I'd come down here and he'd be in his long underwear sitting in the tub. He would be in his long underwear 
sitting in the tub. <laughs> yeah. What was Scotty like? You knew him on a daily basis. What was the guy really like? He had a great sense of humor, very colorful, very wise. He could size people up right away. Really? Mm -hmm. He was very wise. Was he as good a storyteller as you hear? Oh, yes. He could tell <laughs> stories that have never been told or will be tell told again. <laughs> Would he make them up or did they have... Well, some of them happened and some of them he made up. Mm -hmm. He was a showman. He learned a lot about that when he was with Buffalo Bill for 12 years. And uh, he would make people laugh. And that's what he liked. In the evening, they'd talk together in the Great Hall, as they called it. Talk, I, I've sat there with them and heard them talk for about two hours and just thoroughly enjoy talking to each other about everything, all subjects. Was Mr. Johnson fascinated with the West? These pictures I've seen of him, he, you would never have guessed he was a Chicago insurance man. You would, he, he looked like he wanted to be a cowboy. I think he did. He was reared a Quaker boy, he couldn't get dirty. He, he, his mother was very strict with him, but he did read uh, Wild West books, and I think that was his first interest, and when Scotty came along, he, he was interested in his life. What would they do? Go on trips out across the... Yes, he'd be out. Mr. Johnson would come from Chicago, and Scotty would meet him with horses and mules, and for a month they would travel together. Out in these hills? Yes, in the mountains. Well, that was tough, wasn't oh, it? Oh, it was tough. It was hard. They really were opposites, yes. weren't they? Oh, definitely. In what ways? Well, Scotty ran away from home when he was 11 years old, had no education. Mr. Johnson was a graduate of Cornell University. He was very quiet, never said gosh, and Scotty was profane. <laughs> but they got along. The opposites got along. Now, Bill, come over here just a minute, because this has got to be interesting for you. You knew Scotty and knew him well, and yet here's a guy who looks just like him. Does he really? Very much. His eyes and his build and his facial expression, his ways. My Bill, my build, is this what you're talking about? <laughs> yeah. huh? Oh, yes, I'm talking about everything. But now he doesn't cuss like Scotty. Well, I haven't heard him yet. <laughs> because that must be a compliment coming from Mary, oh, it sure who is. knew Scotty so it well. Sure is. I was introduced to her first time a couple years ago, and I wasn't sure whether this would work or not. But she looked at me for the first time and says, you're wearing your hot little wrong, Scotty. You gotta tip it back a little more. <laughs> so I knew that I was accepted. Uh, Is that? Did he always have it tipped? Oh a certain? yes. Oh yes. He always kind of on the back of his head, many times. But he always had this red, red tie. Red tie. Red tie. And, and white the shirt. white shirt and the pants that didn't have to be ironed. That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> what an interesting. Uh, guy this guy must have been oh, oh he, he was. was there's only one scotty there'll never be another now when you say that what do you mean well he was different in so many ways he seemed rough he was profane and yet underneath there was something else now mary we are now up above scotty's castle and Scotty's buried right here. What is the story behind why he is buried here on this spot? One day when he was sitting down in his veranda outside of his room in the castle, he looked up here and he said, you know, I would like to be planted up there. Planted? <laughs> on top of that windy hill. and. Well, I said, why would you want to be there? Well, he said, it's all rock, and I'll keep well. And so I said, that's right, Scotty, you're, you're going to be up there. 
So that day came and it took two days, eight men to dig the grave because it was all rock. And he was placed here. And here he is today. Where he wanted to be. Where he wanted to be. On the side of a very windy hill, looking out over his castle into his beloved Death Valley. That's right. And next to him is his devoted dog, Wendy. And she's buried on Windy Hill. <laughs> but she survived him about one year and she, with a broken heart. Well, this is the place, this is where he should be, isn't it? That's right, overlooking the castle. And he is. And many people visit him here. He'll not be forgotten. Well, hello everybody, I'm Huell Hauser, and I sure hope you enjoyed this adventure. If you'd like to see it again, or share it with your family or friends, or perhaps donate a copy to your local school or library, it's available on video cassette and on DVD. All you have to do is call 1-800-266-5727, and we'll be glad to send it to you right away. <laughs>